This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode, where my guest is New Zealand-based landscape designer, Joe Wakelin. Joe creates low-impact and environmentally conscious spaces, and her own garden is a masterclass in water-wise planting that sits lightly within the landscape. Beautiful, but in keeping with its surroundings, both aesthetically and ecologically. We talk about her extensive research and the lessons she's learned along the way. I'm Jo Wakelin. I've been a plants person probably all my life. I actually grew up in, on a high country property, or what we would call a high country sheep station. So I had a very wild childhood, lovely wild places to be in, and I think they've been very formative in my life. I studied plant science and ecology at university, and then promptly went overseas, as most young Kiwis do, and um, travelled the world, um, South Africa, spent some time in the UK, and ran the London Marathon, which was one of our lovely highlights, and did lots of things overseas, but I finally did come back, and I took up a role after some time teaching horticulture in a tertiary institution, what we call a polytechnic, um, the Australians would call it TAFE, um, so teaching practical skills, but with a science background. So that was right up my alley. I loved that. Um, I ran a commercial nursery as well as teaching um, students how to propagate, how to select plants, teaching about plant science weeds, those sorts of things. Um, So I did that for quite a long time, but I always um, dipped into the commercial world, things that kept me interested and kept me going. Um, And I started my own garden here where I am now about 18 years ago. So I've recently finished teaching. And now I've got my own consultancy business, um, pretty much around larger sites. Um, not, I'm not a, a trained landscape architect, and I tend to do more rural sites. Um, at the moment, my one of my main projects is working on a project called the Thompson's Wetland, where we're, it's actually a constructed wetland to treat water flowing off farmland um, and other land and actually return it back to good high quality water going back into a river. So that's um, involving 45,000 sedges that don't mind a bit of inundation. And it's, yeah, it's quite a quite a lovely project to be involved with. So that's what I do. We've also got a four hectare cherry orchard and a fit of madness. I don't quite know why we decided to do that. But um, so, yes, there's plenty to keep me going. So that's what I do now. People, unfortunately, because this is a podcast, don't have the benefit of seeing your garden behind you as I did. But I wondered if you could describe your garden, you know, what's the history of it and how much have you developed it in the 18 years you've had it? Well, when I came here, Sarah, this was a completely bare site. It was just had some pastoral grass on it that was chewed right to the ground, um, had very little in the way of fencing and very windy site glacial outwash soil so we have a quite a glacial history in New Zealand Um, so very stony and gravelly soils very low organic matter where I live in central Otago New Zealand I'm surrounded by mountain ranges Mount Paisa St Baffin's Range the Dunstan Mountains most of them are around the 2000 meter mark but I sit in a valley um, looking up at all these beautiful mountain ranges so I thought this was probably the second garden that I'd lived in. I thought I would try, again, another fit of madness, to actually develop a garden without any water. I do use water in the vegetable garden, obviously, and for larger trees in the distance. I bought 12 hectares, so I've got quite a bit of land here, not that I garden at all. So I had a lot of rabbits when I turned up. I was quite horrified. Um, I was also quite horrified to find out how dry the site was. So some years we've had below 300 millimetres of rain, which is getting close to desert sort of conditions. Summers are quite warm. We get up to about 36 degrees Celsius, and winters maybe minus 10 Celsius would be a cold night, a very cold night. We don't usually get that cold these days. Things have warmed a little. So I set out to – I did visit Beth Chateau's garden, and I'd read quite a lot of her work early on. So I decided I'd just have a test ground to see what I could grow without water. And I thought that the plant palette would be quite small, but I've been overwhelmed by the numbers of plants 
that are very happy in this situation with no irrigation of any kind. So that, that's really what I've, I've done. Obviously, this has drawn some international attention now. And I've spoken quite widely through New Zealand about my project. I really wanted to make sure that the landscape that I created was aesthetically pleasing. And I wanted to respect the location. There needs to be a real sense of place with this amazing landscape around me. So therefore, I wanted quite a restrained aesthetic. And I didn't want to... I wanted to feel like I was at the bottom of a crucible amongst these magnificent mountains and that I could distill the colours I saw in the distance and the shapes. So that, that was where I set out aesthetically. And on a sciencey side, I set out just to test plants. And if I found something that I thought did really well and I liked the look of and I liked the maintenance aspect of it, um, I grew more of it. So I could propagate it at my workplace, which was very, very nice. So I tested lots and lots of species. There were some failures. And after a while, I got better at reading. I did intensive reading on what might be suitable. And there are some sort of stories about certain plants that they're very drought tolerant, but they weren't like that here. And so they, they failed. So I learned to um, read more into what, the original habitat was. And there are plenty of places far, far drier than where I live and far, far colder and with more summer heat. So I felt like there should be a reasonable palette out there. And it's just a matter of sifting through, keeping trying. I learned to plant very small grade plants. It's one of the sort of standard techniques in establishing a garden with no water. I used to use learn to use longer pots, um, so the roots are heading downwards. Lots of things like that were pretty important in success. I've got to a point now where I still want to keep in introducing plants. There are a lot more plants that I would like to grow. Unfortunately, New Zealand's plant biosecurity is very strict, and we can only bring in seed of plants which are on this list. And I totally respect the reasons why. But I, yeah, I hanker after a lot of the plants that I've seen overseas, um, which I know I can't have here, um, which is always a bit unfortunate. But it's still possible to cultivate a palette of huge water wise plants without some of those beauties from other parts of the world. I've looked to a lot of the Mediterranean sites. And many of those plants don't like the cold here. And so I have to be quite selective about which med plants I, I use. There are a lot of the North American plants from Utah and Nevada are really, really good. And I've been fortunate to meet fantastic plants from travelling to New Zealand, like Paniyoti Kaladis, who um, let me into his private seed list, um, which was pretty fun. So I've, I've managed to source seed of plants that are legal in New Zealand, but hard to purchase or find seed within New Zealand. So things like some of the Eremuris, for example, the foxtail lilies, which do so well here. They've been gone from Central Asia to Paniotis position at the Denver Botanic Gardens and then seed came to me and I grew them. So there, there are lots of ways that I've managed to collect plants, but it's really the trialling in this low nutrient, dry soil and seeing if they survive the wind and all the things that go with it that's sort of added to the success. I didn't want to have a few species and hundreds of them. I wanted to have quite a diverse palette. Um, Biomonotony is not something that I can really deal with. So I, I did divide the garden into half. I, I drew myself a plan. I divided the garden into a... But what rather happened that way, I have exotic plants on one side and I have quite a collection of New Zealand natives from the area where I am, which I've mostly propagated by cuttings or grown from seed. So they, I figured, should be happy here. Um, lots of New Zealand alerias, caprosmas, sephora, which is our beautiful kofi. So I've got quite a range of lancewoods and a number of other plants, flaxes around my dam. I do have an irrigation pond, which is used for the orchard. So I have got water, but I don't use it for the garden. 
Um, so, yeah, I have plants from all the colder parts of the world, and there's many, many more I could grow. I mean, there's so much to unpack there, but when you were talking about the native plants being kind of on one side and then your exotic stuff on the other, do you mix them or do you keep them apart? Yes, well, that's an interesting question because Noel Kingsbury really delved into this when he wrote the chapter on my garden in his book Wild, The Naturalistic Garden. I had to really examine my own thinking about this and I think he and I both came to the conclusion that the New Zealand plant texture and colour, they're very olivey in many cases. Um, there's very definite olive tones. They don't really mix with the typical dry plants from the med or from other places and they just seem to fit with each other and because I trained in ecology I guess I was used to the plant communities the New Zealand plant communities our native communities and I felt that they all fitted together and they didn't look right I tried a few but I haven't persisted with that for some reason it's just the way I feel the way that you garden will be utterly different to what somebody like me, for example, is used to doing because my views from my gardens would tend to be maybe a neighbour's fence or something. So we don't have those big sweeping views that we have to make our garden sit within and work within. And I was thinking when you were talking about the fact that you've got the mountains as a backdrop and everything, and is there kind of a formula for making a garden fit into its landscape? I think people do assume that maybe you need to have more ornamental stuff towards the house and then you kind of blend it out into the landscape. Is that just received wisdom? Are there other ways we can integrate a garden into the landscape or indeed make it completely contrast with the landscape so that can draw you in too? What are your feelings on that? I prefer to take the humble approach and actually not make too much of a, a noise about myself and blend in as carefully and skillfully as I could. I wanted to reflect those shapes. I really wanted to draw draw that landscape in and feel like I don't see many other houses. I can see some houses, but I've tried to, to disguise them. But I really wanted to fit into that landscape and for people not to really know where I lived. Um, in the sense of they couldn't see a large house sticking out. And I feel you must respect a landscape like that. So basically, lots of organic sort of curving shapes, hummocky mounds that handle the wind, no straight lines anywhere. Um, that was my intuitive response to the landscape. I just wanted to gently blend out. But it took a lot of thinking in those early days. I really struggled with how to do that and create an edge to the garden that I didn't manage beyond. Um, it was quite tricky, but I feel reasonably happy with where I got to. I'm sure. I mean, it's a stunning garden. So, yes, absolutely. And you mentioned as well the glacial outwash soil. And I'm guessing that, you know, maybe just in your area, but that is, as you say, fairly common. So how much of an impact will your research have on other gardens and other designers? Will it inform their work? Is that what you're hoping? Well, I have been sort of chirping away about this for quite a long time, Sarah, and I've done a bit of work for various local councils on water demand management because of water metering. People want to know how to use less water. And um, I certainly have been making lots of, during my time running this commercial nursery where I worked, lots of displays about reducing water use and plants that are flourish will flourish in that environment it's really not just a matter of surviving it's a matter of them actually looking really really good and being very happy in those dry situations um, they don't like irrigation um, and for people to see that they can um, reduce their water use quite easily and have a have a lovely garden still that they're proud of you're right in town it is it's a different sort of design but you can still have a water-wise garden in in town here. Um, and there are certainly a number of them, people who've clicked on to what I'm doing. Um, I've done a display garden in the centre of Cromwell with water-wise plants, and we did brochures. We, we did, I've done a lot of education around it as well. It was part of my role within my workplace and within the Polytechnic. And I, they, they, but they were very generous to me. Otago Polytechnic sent, let me go to see South of France and Olivia Philippi's garden and his nursery, which was an absolute buzz. I, I really, really enjoyed meeting him and I've read his books 
from cover to cover many times. Um, so they they did help sponsor that, and I think that the community around me has certainly picked up. And from the numbers of people who want to come and visit before they start a garden, I think that indicates there has been a slow, gentle change of culture, um, in New Zealand at least. In many places they don't need to irrigate, but some very, very wet places in New Zealand, and I certainly live in the driest part. But if I can do it, then and demonstrate that um, other people certainly can. It's a matter of sometimes starting with a clean slate, but I, yeah, it's totally possible if I can do it here. Maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but I think people assume that New Zealand is fairly resource rich and, you know, has a good climate for growing things. So it's interesting to know that you need to think about the water wise planting. Is that just an issue in your region or is it something that should be rolled out? Well, I think in a, in a lot of urban situations now, people are paying for water, their water's metered, um, which it should be. Um, and of course, all the infrastructure in townships and cities is built for water is built around the day with the maximum use which is probably for us is in January or February when you know people are watering a lot of lawn um, watering their gardens and so all the infrastructure the pumping the pipes the tanks whatever has to be geared towards that day of maximum use so I take great pride in not having to use any plastic piping which is another um, thing I think We've actually forgotten my grandmother gardened without irrigation pipes and plastic pipes pre-World War II. Polythene obviously wasn't really invented then, I don't think. So I think that we, we've probably had a couple of generations where once plastic was developed, we've become reliant on irrigation systems and automatic controllers. And I love the freedom of not having to use any of that. I think using this water as part of a decarbonisation journey because water and energy are so tightly entwined. If you have water, generally it's taken some energy to pump it, possibly clean it, chlorinate it, how, wherever you are, but and then to deliver it without thinking about the infrastructure to do all that. So I think it's part of a simpler life, creating a garden that doesn't need to be watered. Um, it's not just about the water. So, yeah, that's that's probably become very deep and meaningful for me now. Yeah, that's a really, you know, holistic way and a very important message, actually, I think, that everybody could do with reminding of it just, it isn't just about that one element, it's about everything that surrounds it. So, you know, that's really important. And in terms of the wider landscape, if you'll pardon the pun, of garden design and landscape architecture in New Zealand. Do you think that is an ethos that's permeating or are you noticing that there are kind of other schools of thought emerging? What does that look like at the moment? It's hard for me to say that, Sarah. I think New Zealand's climate varies so widely and rainfall varies so widely. I mean, we've had dreadful, dreadful floods in the last year in the North Island um, that have caused massive damage and a number of deaths and uh, terrible floods. Um, we more and more exposed to um, tropical storms and cyclones coming down from the Pacific, um, which down in the South Island we don't really feel the effects of. So when they're having that sort of situation, we're also very dry. So we're a country of small extremes. So I I think that probably alongside this is the sort of the design style of looking um, softer, less formal, um, the naturalistic style, which... Noel Kingsbury dissects very carefully in the book Wild. I I think that sits very well with a garden that doesn't use water. They sort of fit together very nicely. But throughout New Zealand, there is still a massive amount of range of styles. I mean, from formal city gardens to wild gardens like mine out in the heart of the country. It just depends where people live. There are a huge number of New Zealand native gardens, the huge surge like most of the world in vegetable gardening and food production. I think we follow the world to some extent and certainly with most of our settlers, earlier settlers coming from Europe or especially from the UK, the British style of gardening came here and I like to think that possibly this, my style has moved on from those sort of 
probably wetter climate gardens and they're not really practical here where I live. I completely understand that. We do seem to have taken our blueprint of gardens and put it in places where it, it really isn't suitable. <laughs> um, so, yes, that is a thing. Have you got any peers that you would recommend to people? Because, you know, if you wanted to highlight anyone else's work who you think is doing really good stuff at the moment, it'd be interesting, again, just for me to know uh, who's going to check out because it's not my area of expertise. Oh, gosh, there are so many. I sort of was dragged kicking and screaming into Instagram. Noel Kingsbury said to me, and what's your Instagram handle? I said, oh, I don't do Instagram. Too busy for that. And um, then it finally got to me and I thought, I'm going to try this. And, of course, then I've, it's opened up a world of people who are doing very similar things all over. There are Australians where obviously it's very, very dry, but a lot warmer in most cases. There are, oh, there are so many. I couldn't really begin to start. But I guess Olivia Philippe's the, the the guru who I really respect because he's really dissected each plant species and given it a drought code. And I, I think that's been really, really, really good way to describe plants. Um, and I found his drought code very effective. I, if it's a drought code five, I know that it will probably survive here in my dry, dry summers. I'm really impressed with Lauren Springer's work, The Undaunted Woman from the States, Lauren's book, The Undaunted Garden. Um, she, she's been an absolute leader in her area. And I'm, I've been reading her book lately. Oh, there are so many. Um, and yeah, often it's just little snippets through Instagram, but um, Kate Coulson's garden in Provence, looking out into those beautiful hills. I, I find her images inspirational, and she'll often describe a plant which she's discovered is really, really dry tolerant, and she loves and has done well. So it's partially it's the aesthetic, but it's sometimes it's the actual plant that really makes a difference in your structure and doesn't need water. Thank you very much to Joe and to you for listening. Now here's Dr Ian Bedford talking about something that I think we've all experienced if we've ever grown plants in containers. Usually during March, the RHS publishes a hit parade of garden nasties, which lists the top 10 plant pests from the previous year. And every year without fail, there's one pest that's always on that list, and usually near the top. And that's the black vine weevil, Ocherinchus sulcatus. For the lucky few who've not encountered vine weevils in their garden, they're black flightless beetles, just under one centimetre long, with patches of tiny dull yellow hairs on their backs. And they have distinctive long broad snouts, with small elbowed antennae attached. Active from June to October, the adult weevils spend the day hidden amongst garden debris, emerging at dusk to feed nocturnally on leaves, making notches all around the edges. Although unsightly, their feeding won't affect the plant's growth, but their leaf notching provides a useful indicator as to where their much more harmful larvae might be found. Their larvae are cream-white C-shaped grubs that live their entire life underground feeding on roots, bulbs, corms, and the basal stems of many different plants within borders, pots, and containers throughout the British Isles. And the damage they cause will often result in stunting, wilting, and even death to many plants where infestations are high. So how can we deal with vine weevils? Well, eradicating an established infestation within an open garden is near on impossible since the adults will be numerous and widespread, and each will be a parthenogenetic female that will lay around a thousand minute eggs into the soil throughout the summer months. And the grubs too will be abundant underground, often protected amongst the roots of broadleaf evergreen shrubs and conifers. However, it's certainly possible that vine weevil infestations within open gardens could be significantly reduced by their natural predators, which can be attracted in by providing a safe environment with sheltered habitats and by not using pesticides. From predatory soil mites and nematodes to ground beetles, centipedes, toads and the insectivorous birds should soon take control. Eradicating vine weevils from pots though is a much easier task. 
and it's best done during early spring, whilst the almost mature grubs are still in winter dormancy. Simply empty the affected pots, dispose of the old compost, and then after checking for grubs amongst the roots, repot any plants into fresh compost. Failure to do this will allow the grubs to become active again, pupate, and emerge as egg-laying adults a few weeks later. Once repotted, a dry topping of grit, or even crushed olive pomace, could be layered on the surface to deter any future roving adult weevils from accessing the compost. Perhaps followed later by a prophylactic treatment of commercially available predatory nematodes that can be watered through the pot topping during the summer months. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.